And now for today's lecture, very excited to introduce Ed Luna, who's been a frequent discussion contributor in this lecture series. Uh, so Ed Luna is currently a professor of English language and literature at, I don't know how to say this exactly properly, Ed, uh, Kyushu University. Oh, Kyushu, Kyushu oh, University. Kyushu, okay, I did it okay. At Fukuoka, Japan. Uh, he specializes in Austronesian languages of Western Indonesia, especially Balinese and Indonesian. He's played Balinese music. He's played Javanese music. He's also been a dancer and currently is now based in Japan. Um, and he is, uh, but still very much involved in the Indonesian cultural scene. And been, uh, it's been a pleasure to have him here at these lectures and a pleasure to present him here today. So thank you so much, Ed, and I'm gonna pass it off to you. Um, oh, and also uh, Lisa Gold actually just uh, sent me a message. She's gonna do a lecture on the 30th, so that's, that's a go, and we'll have the information for that one up on the website soon as well. Um, all right, take it away, Ed. So this talk will be basically going over uh, some examples of uh, old Javanese and old Balinese texts, and uh, what and about what can we uh, gather from looking at those texts, and how can we link it up to uh, other Austronesian languages, so like the Philippine type languages and uh, and Formosan type languages, and what can that tell us about uh, where these things come from? And then after that, I would like to talk about uh, some possible, uh, let's say, uh, present projects and future projects that I've been thinking about uh, to relate both uh, linguistic analysis and uh, Karawitan. Uh, so uh, the first thing I just want to make clear is that, uh, so I've been involved in the Indonesian cultural scene, both as a musician and as a dancer for um, almost 30 years, if I remember correctly. Uh, but, um, you know, for part of that time, I've also been a, a, a linguist, a, a professional linguist, uh, mainly specializing in uh, Balinese and sometimes Indonesian uh, when the uh, need arises. So I hope everyone can hear me because I'm not exactly sure, but um, all right. Uh, so everyone, I, I hope, uh, can see my screen there. And uh, another thing too is that uh, I've uploaded a, a handout uh, with all the examples, all the linguistic examples that uh, I'll be going over today, uh, as well as the um, the URL for uh, Wield. So this, uh, I'm a, a chair member of this particular organization. So it's the Western Institute for Endangered Language Documentation. So uh, if you're interested, uh, you can click over there and see what we're up to. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, I hope everyone can see the screen there. Uh, if not, uh, then please let me know. Uh, but I wanted this to be an informal discussion about a tandem meeting of language and Karawitan. Um, so what I wanted to start off with uh, is um, probably a text that is familiar with uh, most of you. So this is a Kinanti Semidi, uh, the second verse. Uh, so, um, linguistically, there isn't much to say about the first verse, so I'm going on to the second verse, and uh, the glossing here is based on Suenaga 1983's, uh, uh, well, her translation uh, of uh, this particular text, okay? And uh, so I'm giving you the, the first two lines here, so kukusing dupa kumelon, ngeninken tiasang apike. So uh, incense burned, the handsome one cleared his heart. And uh, what I would like you to pay a special attention to are all the um, sort of uh, derived uh, verbs, okay? Uh, so all the, all the verbs that come up with some sort of derivation. And um, I'm also, what I'm also going to do uh, at this point 
is to put them in different colored boxes. So I'm putting uh, forms like Kumelun in uh, red boxes here. And there is a, a, a point uh, why I'm doing this, and I, I will reveal that later on. Uh, so Kumelun gets a red box, and then with uh, Ngeninken, so this is uh, to clear up something, um, I'm going to uh, surround that with a, a green box. And uh, so there's, there's a purpose why I'm doing this. Um, okay, so uh, those are the first two lines. And then let's go on to the second two lines, uh, the next two lines. Okay, so kabunku sagung jajahan nanging sange angikibi. So uh, enclosed within a large area, however, he concealed his thoughts. Okay, so we have two verbs here, two derived verbs. Uh, here as well. So we have kawungku, uh, uh, which I've labeled as pa uh, patient trigger. And uh, I'll, I'll go more into sort of like this, um, how, how do we define uh, like uh, what, what is an agent, what is a patient, basically what is a doer, what is an undergoer, uh, for those of you who are not linguists. Uh, so um, but I, I'm putting these under the same um, category as uh, the uh, the last one, uh, which is ngeningaken, uh, ngeningken. Okay, so kabungku uh, and then angiki b fall under the same sort of system. Okay, same sort of a derivation system here. Okay, and then uh, let's go on to the last two lines of this particular verse, uh, just for uh, completion's sake. Um, there's not much to say here. So, sangresi uh, kaneka putro kang anjog saking yakti. So, uh, the honorable sage uh, Narada uh, is the one who descends from the uh, from the sky. Uh, there's not much to say about this because the only verb here, anjog. It, it doesn't appear with any sort of overt morphology. So there, there's not really much uh, linguistically to say about this one. I mean, if you were looking at uh, sort of bare verb stems, yes, there would be something to say. But for my purposes here, uh, there's not really too much uh, to say about anjog. Okay. And uh, if at any point any of you are sort of confused as to what I'm trying to explain here, uh, then please let me know. Uh, so this, this talk might get a little technical, uh, let's say, on the linguistic side, but I, I, I'm trying to make it as uh, co um, comprehensible as possible so that um, basically most people can follow uh, what I'm trying to say here. Okay. So that's the second verse. Now let's go on to the third verse, uh, just because um, I, I want to find something else that I can put with a red box. And uh, we find it here in the first two lines of the third verse. So we have kagyat risang kapirangu, rinangkul kinimpit kimpit. Okay, so the hesitant one, the one meditating was startled. He is hugged tightly. And uh, what I'm looking at here in, in uh, really specifically is the second line because we have two verbs that belong uh, in the red box group, okay? So I'm just, uh, I'll just put uh, my box there. So we have rinangkul and then kinimpit kimpit. So these fall into the same category as uh, kumelon uh, up in the first example. And then the rest of this verse, uh, there's not too much to say about it. Uh, again, because we have uh, bare verb stems. And uh, for my purposes here, again, um, yeah, there's not too much to say. So I'll just go through this uh, just for uh, completeness sake. So, duhsang retnaning bawano, yakitu kang walangati. So, oh, Narada says, oh, gem of the world, it is you who is worried or has a grasshopper heart, okay? Although there is something uh, about walang, which is sort of interesting, but I'll, 
I can bring that up if anyone is interested. Uh, but it, it, then again, it might be it might be sort of nonsensical. Uh, but it's, it's something that's been uh, hanging in the back of my mind, uh, you know, for quite a while. So those are the uh, third and fourth lines, and then the last two lines are yakitu kang ngenesing tias, yakitu tang kuduk gering. So it is you who is set apart. It is truly you who must be ill. Okay. Uh, and again, there's not too much to say. Um, that tang there, I will get back to this. Um, so uh, keep that tang in mind, but I just want you to focus on the derived uh, verbs uh, for this uh, first part of my explanation. Okay. So what's going on here? So old Javanese and uh, pr probably uh, at this time, these tembang were uh, written and composed, had two distinct voice marking systems at play here. So what is voice marking? So basically this is how you mark uh, certain participants within a clause or a sentence. And uh, I will talk about uh, what some of these uh, voice marking systems are, uh, you know, in, in a few moments. Uh, but I just want you to think about, okay, we have two distinct voice marking systems uh, from different sources, okay? So the examples with the red boxes, uh, we have these two infixes. So we have uh, what I'm calling agent trigger um and patient trigger in. So uh, like if you want to think about, let's say, active versus passives, although I, I don't really subscribe to that. I just, wanted, uh, I just want to be a little uh, less committal to what do I think about actives versus passives. Uh, I, I don't think they really play a role here. I think they play something uh, quite different. Um, but we have um and in, okay? And these uh, particular morphemes are inherited from Proto-Austronesian, Proto the proto-language uh, of which uh, both Javanese, Balinese, and a whole host of other languages, especially the majority of them in the Philippines, Ocean Oceania, Polynesia, and even Malagasy, uh, they all derive uh, from this proto-language uh, we call Proto-Austronesian. And then the examples with the green boxes, what I'm calling uh, agent trigger, uh, so I have an and ng, so these are ho home organic nasal prefixes, and then uh, patient trigger ka. Um, now, I'm saying that these are probably a later innovation, possibly, possibly, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, possibly through uh, Malayic contact, uh, just because like with Malay, it, it'll, it'll sort of make sense uh, when I get to this point. Uh, but I think that uh, contact, extended contact uh, with Malay speakers, all sorts of uh, varieties of Malay uh, had uh, a lot uh, to do with this particular um, uh, end of the system. Okay. So um and in, what are they? Okay, so these are two distinct verbal infixes. So they are inserted within a verbal root through various phonological means, okay? And in Javanese, it's usually just after the first uh, consonant. Uh, that's where you insert um and in, okay? And uh, um and in, why did I say that these are inherited from Proto-Austronesian? Well, in uh, many Formosan and Philippine-type Philippine languages, these mark the focused participant or referent in the majority of transitive sentences. So things that have both what we call a subject and an object and uh, how they relate to uh, that verb in question. Okay, so they marked, uh, something that's in focus, okay? Something that is like uh, prominent for uh, one reason or another.
Okay, so these infixes can be reconstructed back to Proto-Austronesian in most accounts. Most researchers say, yeah, this can be uh, reconstructed to back to Proto-Austronesian. Uh, although, although there are a few scholars like Aldridge, Aldridge uh, 2016, who refute this. Okay, so there's not like um, like across the board agreement, but most scholars think, yeah, um and N are pretty old. And uh, to have, uh, let's say, at least old Javanese and uh, old Balinese, to a certain extent, you know, they, they have these uh, other forms. These clearly connect them to uh, other uh, Austronesian languages, especially the Formosan and Philippine type languages. All right, so I just wanted to go over really quickly uh, what the Austronesian language family is. So uh, the motherland of uh, the Austronesian language family is uh, up to this point uh, is in present day Taiwan. So all the Austronesian languages that you might think of, so uh, pretty much uh, a lot of the languages in, um, in Indonesia, uh, although like in Papua, uh, uh, you have uh, lots of other, uh, let's say, language families being represented there. So that was that area was pretty much settled for a very long time before the Austronesian speakers spread through. So uh, let's see. So uh, from Taiwan, then you have an influx into the Philippines, and then uh, like throughout Western uh, Indonesia, and then from that point, from Borneo, uh, you have a. Um, a strand of speakers going all the way to Malagas, uh, to Madagascar, okay, and they, they speak sort of like a, a language in the Barito sub-branch, okay, and then uh, from that point on, um, you know, also from the Philippines and expanding eastward, so we have uh, various um, migrations to Micronesia and then through Melanesia and then finally Polynesia is sort of like the last strands, the most modern uh, strands of uh, Austronesian to uh, make their way through. Okay, so it's a pretty widespread language family. All right, so this um and in, uh, so these really go back to what's called Austronesian alignment, okay? So uh, what Austronesian alignment is, is a, it's an unusual morphosyntactic alignment. So basically, uh, as I went back, like voice marking, so it, it's just a really unusual way to mark voice. So, uh, with voice marking, you mark how particular reference are uh, relate to uh, the verb that you are featuring, okay? How they're marked in, in a sentence respective to their verb. However, it, this is unusual, but this is quite typical of uh, Formosan and Philippine type languages uh, of the Austronesian family, and it's been lost elsewhere. Okay, so the first thing I have to uh, make sure that you guys uh, understand is uh, we have to go over like uh, these other basic types of alignment first. Uh, I know for the linguists out there, you might sort of roll your eyes at this, but uh, I know that we have a sizable audience who are not linguists, so I cannot take that for granted. Okay, so we have first we have the nominative accusative alignment. So this is where the subject of an intransitive verb and the agent uh, referent of a transitive verb are marked the same, and then the object or patient of the uh, transitive verb is marked differently. Okay, so uh, I'll just take like a, a language that everyone knows here, English. Okay, so we have he walked to school. Okay, so we have the uh, subject of an intransitive uh, verb walk. And then uh, he kicked me. So um, he, uh, of course, is marked the same. And so it's the agent, it's the, it's the doer of this transitive verb, kick. And then me uh, is the object. And, uh, you know, um, it, it's 
a different form than if we were to have that as a subject, which would be I, okay? So he walked to school, he kicked me. Uh, nominative accusative alignment. And then uh, we also have uh, ergative absolutive alignment. So another basic uh, sort of alignment. So this is where you have uh, the subject of the intransitive verb and the object of, of a transitive verb marked the same. And then the agent or the, not really subject, but the agent uh, of a transitive verb is marked differently. Uh, so uh, let me bring out an example from Samoan. Uh, which is an Austronesian language that has bona fide um, ergative absolutive alignment. Uh, so we have in 4A, we have olo'o tamo'e le tene. So uh, the girl is running, and we have le tene, girl, the girl, being marked with, um, well, uh, someone doesn't really have uh, an, uh, a, an overt absolutive marking. Uh, so just, just because it has no article, uh, besides the definite article, le, uh, sort of shows us that, yeah, this is absolutive. And then if we take 4B, so we have olo'o si ele tama le tene. So the boy is lifting the girl. And uh, so le tene, the object, is marked the same. Uh, but uh, le tama, the boy, who is the agent, is marked with this ergative a, e, this ergative article a. E. Okay, so that's ergative absolutive alignment. Now, getting to the good stuff here. Austronesian alignment. Okay. So, and um, Austronesian alignment is sort of seen as uh, sort of like its own thing. Okay, and I will tell you sort of why, and uh, I'll use this by using Tagalog, which is uh, the um, the variety uh, or or like the the language spoken um, pretty much by uh, most Filipinos, but it originates uh, from the area where Manila, uh, the uh, present day capital, is now. So uh, Tagalog has. I, I, I would say one of the most robust and productive examples uh, illustrating Austronesian alignment. So we have this verbal root bili, okay, which means to buy. And of course, this is a, uh, this is a cognate with Indonesian bili, okay, to buy. And uh, let me show you uh, the different types of focus that you can have in Tagalog. So we have the actor focus. So notice the form of the verb, and then notice what is being marked as a direct argument. So the, the DIR marking. Uh, so we have bumili nang saging ang lalaki sa tindahan para songoy. So the man bought bananas at the store for the monkey. So we have uh, um, okay? So we have this um infix uh, being infixed into uh, bili. Uh, meaning to buy, and then uh, what is being marked as a direct argument? So it's the man, okay? So it's, it's an actor, it's the agent. Okay, so that's number five. Uh, number six, we have a patient focus uh, form as well. Uh, so uh, we have uh, this infix in with Billy. Uh, so, binili ng lalaki ang saging sa tindahan para songoy. So, the man bought the banana at the store for the monkey. So, this time, the direct uh, argument, the, the uh, yes, so the direct argument is marked as uh, saging, so banana. And then you also have uh, changes happening to the verb. Okay. And then we also have locative focus. So talking about a location. Okay, so we have pinilhan ng lalaki ng saging ang tindahan para songoy. So the man bought some bananas at the store for the monkey. Okay, so we have pinilhan, uh, that's the verb uh, with uh, the an, uh, which is the locative focus um, uh, suffix. And then 
tindahan, uh, the word for store, is marked with the ang, the direct uh, argument article. We also have the benefactive focus. Uh, so if, you, if you're doing something uh, for the benefit of uh, some other uh, entity. So we have ibinili ng lalaki ng saging angunggoy. So uh, the man bought the monkey some bananas for the monkey. Okay, but in the translation, uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to say like for the monkey uh, just because um, at least for English, we sort of uh, see those as sort of like oblique or as like side arguments. So I just wanted to uh, sort of feature the monkey a little bit more. And so that's what you're supposed to focus on. So we have uh, ibinile, okay? So, uh, so the e is the benefactive focus prefix. And then we have in being infixed into bili. So um, by. Uh, for someone, okay, or something. And then going on, we have the instrumental focus. So we have ipinambili ng lalaki ng saging ang pera ng asawa niya. So uh, the man bought bananas with his wife's money. So uh, we have ipinambili. Uh, so uh, this is the instrumental focus form or bili, the, the uh, verb stem. And then we have ang pera ng asawa niya. So uh, we have ang uh, sort of marking that uh, argument. And then finally, we have the um, reason focus. Uh, for some reason, uh, this thing is done. So uh, instead of saying bili, because uh, it's sort of hard to come up with a, um, uh, sort of a, a sensical sentence, uh, you know, a sentence that would make sense that would use bili as a verb stem. So I just decided to get one from uh, gulat, which means um, surprise. So we have ikina gulat ng lalaki ang pagdating ng ngoy. So the man got surprised because of the monkey's arrival. And we are focusing on uh, the monkey's arrival. Uh, ang pag pagdating ng ngoy. And then uh, we have ikinagulat. Okay, so we have ika, that is the uh, prefix for uh, the reason focus. And then uh, the in is um, infixed into that form. Okay, so I, I hope that everyone's following me so far. Uh, I know this is sort of uh, rather linguistically heavy, um, but. Uh, I did want to tie it into what does this mean for old Javanese? Okay. So uh, the indirect versus the direct case marking articles uh, that we see in Proto Austronesian alignment systems, this is no longer present in old Javanese. So you no longer have this in old Javanese. However, you do have uh, formally, it seems like you have some remnants of this but it no longer uh, really marks like indirect versus uh, direct. Uh, so instead, okay, uh, so you have the presence of the quote unquote definite article an. Hmm, okay, this looks rather suspicious, okay? And uh, I'm not, I'm not, willing to venture uh, to say that uh, ang in uh, old Javanese definitely came from uh, where, uh, or the source uh, where, uh, from where Tagalog gets its ang as the direct argument marker. But I mean, it's, it's quite suspicious. Okay, so we have in 11, so we have girigirin uh, tangratu. So the king is seized with fear. So we have uh, the particle. So ang all it pretty much it heart you know. So if there's like a particle, it will become a clitic uh, to. So it'll attach itself to uh, any sort of preceding uh, particle. Okay. So the king is seized with fear. And then we have lungha tek 
tekan duta. So the envoy left. Okay. Again, we have this ang, this uh, definite uh, article, uh, attaching itself to uh, you know uh, left words, uh, left leaning uh, onto uh, preceding uh, particles here. Okay. So we have a particle uh, ta and then ika. Uh, so it's a demonstrative. Uh, forming the word uh, tekan. So another thing I hope you've noticed here uh, in examples 11 and 12 is that Old Javanese is predominantly verb or predicate initial. Okay, this is another important thing. Um, so this is a trait shared by many Philippine type and Formosan languages. So, and um, I think many scholars would say, yeah, like Proto-Austronesian is pretty much, it, you know, it, barring some exceptions, is pretty much verb initial. So this is like a, a very ever-present trait in um, the Formosan uh, type languages and the Philippine type languages, although it gets, it gets lost in uh, many uh, Indonesian languages, and you hardly see this. So what exactly happened? Okay, and I will give you uh, some, I hope to give you a, a story that makes sense as to what happened. Okay, so the verbal infixes were formally preserved here. So uh, um, uh, just became an agent focus or agent trigger, okay? And then in, um, so in originally stood for some sort of perfective aspect, okay? Some sort of completed aspect. Uh, I'm saying here that it, it probably went, uh, underwent some sort of reanalysis after uh, Lanaker 1977 to explicitly mark patient focus or patient trigger. Okay, so you have um marking like agent focus and you need sort of like a, a patient counterpart. So I, I'm thinking that's what happened there in old Javanese. Uh, another thing is that Old Javanese lost the distinction between direct and indirect argument marking articles. So this is, uh, besides the definiteness uh, or the definite article, ang, okay, uh, so this has mostly been innovated uh, by putting on uh, several types of verbal suffixes. So like the transitivizing Akan and e uh, onto the verbs to fill in those gaps. Okay, so that's old Javanese. So what about for old Balinese? Not exactly. Okay, so back to Zerbuchen, uh, 1987, uh, and she takes this from Teu. Uh, 1965. Okay, so um in this case is the state of aspect. Okay. And then in is a goal or patient focus. However, uh, Teo assigns this particular function to the ya infix, which I'm not exactly sure whether I've seen this, uh, but I, I'm sure that it's present in a much older texts of old Balinese. So I'm giving you an example with um. So we have aptin ulun manke ang lumaksana reda. So I intend to go out, old one. So we have uh, uh, laksana, which means to walk, and then it's infixed with um. And uh, take a look at that. We have the definite article there, an. Okay. And then uh, a form marked with the in uh, infix. So we have sarining uh, ratna mantra. So uh, the honorable deity embodies the essence of the holy Vedic scriptures. 
So we have uh, this infix in uh, being combined. It's being put into gelaran, so to uh, take form. So uh, for old Balinese, it seems to me uh, that um was re reanalyzed as a state of as spectral marker. So much like the switch from aspect marking to voice marking in uh, of in in old Javanese, but sort of in reverse for the other infix at play here. And then in kept its patient focus marking, or maybe it innovated it, um, you know, at the same time uh, from, you know, from old Javanese, it, it's hard to tell at this point. Again, no indirect versus direct ar uh, argument marking articles. So yeah, so it's not part of the, this Austronesian alignment, even though you can, uh, you know, place uh, some formal things you know, directly back to that particular source. And uh, there's also a predominant shift of word order from verb initial to verb medial uh, position. Uh, so you might be thinking at this point, like what caused this to happen? So like uh, this uh, first sort of like a bleaching of this uh, alignment system and then uh, reforming it uh, and then uh, also like this um, uh, constituency order or word order change. So what happened? So how did this develop? So uh, let's consider the maleo sumbawan subgrouping. So this is from Adelar uh, 2005. And you notice that Javanese is not part of this subgrouping. Um, so he says that we have all these languages. So um, Balinese is most, um, most related to uh, Sasak and Sumbawa. Okay, and then we have Balinese uh, from uh, um, Bali, Sasak, Sumbawa. And then uh, it branches off of the Malaya Chamic uh, sub, uh, subgroup. So uh, Chamic and Malayic uh, spread off from that. And then we have Madhuris and Sundanese. Uh, sort of combining everything together to create the proto malayan Sumbawan uh, subgrouping. Yeah, so uh, Balinese is down there. Okay, Javanese is in another branch, according to Adelar. Now, the other thing that I have to bring up here is um, David Gill's um, idea of the Mekong Mamburamo linguistic area or Sprachbund. Uh, and uh, he wrote on this back in 2015. So he said, uh, there are several types of traits that would link uh, all these areas from the Mekong down to the Mamburamo River to the exclusion of both uh, present day Taiwan and the Philippines. Uh, so uh, from the Mekong down to the Mambaramo uh, River, uh, we have all of these, uh, let's say, traits, all these linguistic traits that would suggest that, yeah, we have a, a linguistic area uh, going on here. So uh, what do we have? Uh, so we have uh, like Taikadai languages at play here. We have uh, uh, Mon Khmer languages at play here, okay? Uh, along with uh, Mal uh, Malay and other such languages. So this is something that's happened through language contact. So let me talk about uh, characteristics of the Mekong Mambaramo uh, linguistic area. So according to uh, Gill, according to David Gill, he talks about seven, 17 separate features um, however, uh, I would say the most relevant features that I'm uh, fo focusing on right now are uh, his eighth one, so basic SVO, so basic subject ver verb object order, okay? And we've seen this, okay? Uh, number nine, iamative uh, perfects. So this is when we have like sudah 
or wis or wus or suba, meaning already, but also indicating that something's been completed. Okay. Uh, so I am at a uh, perfect. And then uh, number 12, weakly developed grammatical voice. Yeah, in most of these cases, um, the verbal marking is just left to a, a minimum. And it's up to other factors like word or, or word order to uh, really create a sense of uh, what is grammatical voice here. And even uh, some of those cases are quite iffy. Uh, and then uh, number 16, uh, the absence of case marking. Yes, we've definitely seen this in old Balinese and old Javanese and later on to contemporary Javanese and uh, Balinese. And then optional tab marking. Okay, so what uh, tab marking meaning uh, tense aspect mood marking or how co committed are you to the trap, the truth value of a statement. Uh, so in Philippine type languages, tam marking is necessary. So it's required. Uh, but in these languages, uh, in this uh, uh, Mekong Mambaramo uh, linguistic area, it's optional. Okay, so what, going back to Balinese and Javanese, so what about them? So I'm saying that uh, they must have had extensive contact with each other. So uh, there must have been a relatively high degree of lexical congruency, but much less morph morphosyntactic likeness. Especially when we consider like the borrowings from like their, their multi-stratified uh, lex uh, lexicon. Uh, so like their, their word lists. And then uh, the effects of the Mekong Mambarano linguistic area, this is most likely brought on and spread about uh, by Malay traders uh, at some point during the history uh, between uh, or from Old Javanese and Old Balinese uh, down to the uh, contemporary versions today. And then uh, the extensive points of language contact led to the reduction of voice marking complexity uh, plus this verb medial word order. And uh, you also see this in ancient Malay texts as well. So the hikayat. Um, so you can, out, you can see uh, like the development there as well. And then because the Philippine and Formosan type languages were not a part of the Sprachbund, so they kept a lot of their ancestral features, especially with voice marking. And it's still very productive. So for Javanese, uh, so you have the Uman in preserved in the theatrical register. So it's still being used, but only in uh, for theatrical purposes and perhaps some literary sources as well. Uh, but a lot of this has disappeared in most contemporary contexts. And then for Balinese, so the Uman in, these, uh, these are certain markers that are explicit for Basakawi. So this is a poetic register with uh, old or middle Javanese with pre-Majapai era, era Balinese. Um, I'm, I'm not so much an expert in Kawi, uh, but that's the impression that I'm getting. And then it's absent. So these um and in forms are mostly absent in uh, conversations in contemporary Balinese, except in certain fossilized expressions. So we have kasumayan. Uh, so to be to be respected. So we have the patient trigger ka, okay, and then um the state of being infixed into sayang sumayang. So uh, to love or respect kasumayan. So to be respected. 
when I first saw this, like I didn't realize that Um had gained uh, this stative uh, sort of um, meaning. So I thought this was like a voice marking and I'm just sort of thinking like, why is this ka, this is patient trigger, why is this combined with um, which should be agent trigger, but then I was sort of misled by that. So now I know. So what can you do with uh, linguistic analysis, uh, analysis in Karawitan? What can you do with it? So uh, the first thing that I want to describe, uh, and this is a project that I've been sort of working on. I was supposed to present this uh, over at the, the SEALS conference uh, this year in Hawaii, uh, you know, before it all, uh, all these conferences got canceled. So I was doing something about the paraphrasing, the process of paraphrase in Palawakia. So here we have a, a picture of, uh, of uh, Palawakia. So what is Palawakia? So basically it is a subgenre of something called Babaosan. Okay, so Babaosan is uh, in other terms, uh, reading, okay, from the uh, Balinese root baos, which means to read. Okay, uh, refined uh, Balinese. So this is the tradition of reading text from a, a lontar, a palm leaf manuscript, and then paraphrasing a translation into the local idiom. Not only that, it is a small genre of dances. So developed in the early 20th century, uh, accompanied by the gongkabiar, ensemble. And this is what you heard uh, during that little interlude uh, before I started my talk. And it's considered one of the quintessential gongkabiar dances. And one of the most difficult to perform uh, because uh, the dancer here is not only required to recite texts, but he or she is also required to dance skillfully, of course, and uh, play the trompon gong chime, uh, gong chime in the middle of it. All right, so what I'd like to do now is to just play, oh, oh sorry. Um, so the original text uh, is usually taken from some sort, uh, some form of kakawin. So these are long narrative poetic texts written in uh, Basakawi. So we have two main participants here. Uh, so we have uh, each line or section recited by Jurutandak. So this is the main reciter or dancer. And then each of that each of those recited lines are translated via paraphrase into refined Balinese by a Juru Arti, so a main translator. So this is from Sidana's uh, 2002's um, thesis uh, with special intonation patterns. Okay. And you'll see this in this next clip. Okay, so hopefully this will play. Hey Ed, we actually yes. can't, you can't hear anything. When you share your screen, you have to click share computer sound as well, or else it won't work. Oh dear. Okay. Yeah, you might have to end your share and then reshare and toggle that button. Okay. Uh, all right, so let me see if I can play this again. Is it playing now?
ซื้อเรื่องกอลนิรันดรังกอโอ้ยกันยกันนิงคุณิกูปิดโดเดวักบงคุณเตอร์สังรามุลุงโนบุมาร์ดตองตองประเดกัดรักุนิกเดสุปารเดสุกจิงักโอเลกิดเรียวานิรกักวรามิวกูอยากจริงหลังมีพิซซ่าโอเค so here is the text that both the juru tanda and the and the paraphrase uh, from the juru arti so we have uh, uh, for the first line and the first line was split in half okay So kawit sarat samaya. So by chance it was autumn, and then the j u r u a r t i says atur ning ayang titiang ring p e n g a t e n g ning kartika m a s e l So I'll say it as clearly as and eloquently as I can. The fourth lunar month was slowly approaching, uh, and then uh, the second uh, half of that is kala uh, nirar parangko. So uh, and then uh, the paraphrase comes in uh, like the following. So r i k a n y a k a n ing p u n i k a i d e w a agung putra sangrama d u n g a m a m a r g a So uh, along with his maiden, the great Lord Rama went on a journey. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight here was okay. So from the original Kawi text. Uh, what I've put here in uh, in italics are uh, the parts that directly relate back to the Kawi text, and then uh, the um, the uh, Juru Arti adds in these sort of like meta commentary uh, pieces. So we have a t o r n i n g ayang titiang and n u n g a m m a r g a s even though like they're going is sort of like implied. Uh, however. It's not explicitly stated. Okay, so uh, the it seems like the uh, translator, the the paraphraser, has some room to add in whatever commentary is necessary for the audience to completely understand uh, the meaning of uh, these lines. And then uh, the last two. Uh, Lines here, so we have ntontang pradesa, so kata uh, desa paradesa kacinga olida. So there were many vill uh, villages and villagers that they saw, and basically the Kawi line just says uh, they saw all the villages. And then uh, the second half of that line is ri havanira kapwa ramyo, so, and then um, uh, the juru um, the juru arti says. Ri uh, salantange p e m a r g i we y a t i mulangunin pisan. So uh, all through their journey, laughs. Uh, it was truly enthralling. Okay, again, uh, we have some parts that are directly based uh, from the uh, the original Kawi text, and then we have other things that were added in. And uh, now I hope this uh, also plays. We have a clip of uh, another kakawin. Uh, I mean, another uh, let's say uh, palawakia session. This time not as a dance, but uh, in its more usual format. So you have the uh, juru tanda and then the uh, juru arti, uh, sort of sitting side by side, uh, and then alternating uh, their turns. Okay, so here we go. 
Again, um, I think uh, these reciters probably beforehand, they sort of uh, work out like how much of each line do they say before the Juru Arti comes in and starts paraphrasing. So uh, in this case, we have the Juru Tanda able to recite the full line before going on to the next. Uh, so uh, here we have Kawit uh, Sarat Samayo, Kalonirar Parangko. So it happened to be autumn uh, season that they were there. And then the Juru Arti comes in and says, Nemunink Sasi Katigane, Nampi Sasi Kapate Punika. So it fell on the third lunar month and went into the fourth. So really talking about what season this was. Okay, basically. And then uh, we haven't gone on to the rest of this particular phrase, and that will have an effect as to the next session of paraphrasing, as you'll see here. So we have Nton Tang Pradesa Rihawanira Kapua Ramyo. So they, they, sorry, it's, it's supposed to uh, say saw. They saw all the villages and all was splendid. And then uh, the uh, Juru Arti says, Wantah dewasane dawa ide nunga marga. So on that very day, he went on his journey. Which sort of, sort of suggests that, yes, this is supposed to relate to the previous line. So the original Kakawin text should be a guide as to what are you supposed to paraphrase? Okay, so it should be a guide. Uh, however, it, uh, the text itself does not have a final say in the eventual shape of the paraphrasing, uh, which can spill into the next paraphrasing event. Okay, so as long as you complete uh, whatever it is that you have to say for that paraphrase within the whole event, within that particular verse, then I think uh, things will be all right. Uh, how, however, you can sort of bend and you could sort of stretch uh, some lines of paraphrase to fit your needs. So there, there's, uh, and I'm not sure whether this is sort of worked out before or whether, um, you know, this is sort of like made up or these sorts of decisions are made online as the paraphraser and uh, the jurutanda are going. Um, but maybe uh, in those pairings, uh, maybe those people have worked for a very long time. So they have like a set routine, but uh, again, 
you sort of have to wonder, okay, uh, how are these decisions actually made? Uh, another thing about these paraphrasings is that they can be creative adjusted, creatively adjusted to address the immediate uh, per, uh, performance context or the audience. So, in, especially in the form of a meta commentary. So, especially in that first uh, example where the um, the uh, Juru Arti says, "Atorning ayanti piang," I'll say it as eloquently as possible, as beautifully as possible. All right, so going on here, this is sort of like my last uh, sort of thing before I uh, leave it up to questions. Uh, I want to talk something about heroes, language, karawitan, and anime or manga. Okay, so I've been here in Japan for the past two years, and uh, ever since uh, this whole epidemic uh, started, I've been stuck mostly at home, and I've uh, been reading through uh, quite a uh, a lot of issues of manga. Uh, and if you don't know what manga is, it's basically uh, Japan's uh, sort of comic industry, very popular comic industry, and the derivative uh, anime, which is uh, their animations. Okay. So I want to talk about first about how is the hero archetype uh, constructed linguistically. Okay, so in Java, there are two primary models of the hero archetype. Okay, both from the Mahabharata epic. So your primary he hero, what most people would consider the primary he hero, would be Arjuna, or in his younger days, Parmadi. So he is considered a master archer. He's refined, calm, and collected, or what we would say as Alus. Okay, and then women persistently pursue him. So they chase him. He doesn't really go chasing after the women, but they chase him. Um, and then we have a complementary, what I'm calling the complementary or the alternate hero uh, figure type, uh, figure, who is uh, Bima or Bratasena or Workudara in his uh, younger age. Uh, so he is a strong man. And he is also marked by these uh, panchonoko nails. So he has killer nails. He's strong and taciturn and is strong willed. Okay. And uh, when he speaks Javanese, he will only use moko or the low uh, speech style of Javanese. There's only one exception to this, though. When he faces Dewa Ruchi, his godhead, he will revert to Kromo. The, the more refined uh, speech levels of Javanese. But that's it. Uh, with his family, even with like superiors, even with, with strangers, uh, which would be really unthinkable for anybody else to do in Javanese society, he will use moko. Okay, so there's Arjuna. And there's a figure of Arjuna. If you don't know who he is, he's a, a bit slight. Okay, and then here's Bimo, much bigger, much bigger, uh, much stronger, and uh, I'll just play this for you. So this is from, uh, well, a clip from a Dewa Ruchi uh, sort of um, a performance, and uh, at in this instance, he has, um, well, he has just defeated two demons who were actually transformed from gods. So one of them being Batara Bayu, and I believe the other one, Batara Indra. So these were two gods who were punished for their uh, transgressions, and they had to take the form of demons before Bhima goes out and uh, kills both of them. So this is what happens like afterwards. <laughs> Usulun tompo kita ngaku lagi pamak dia kelawan panjenengan ulun. Opo sabape ngatasi kue tadi dewo isi nyambi tadi buto. Okay. So uh, we have Bima 
first first starting out here is saying Batara Bayu Bodo Raharjo. So uh, Batara Bayu, I hope that you are prosperous as well. And then Bayu says Yo Yo Kulo Wosulun Tompo Kita Ngaturake Tambagio Kalawan Tanjenengan Ulun. So yes, yes, my son. I know that we say that we are pleased with you. Uh, and um, there's not too much uh, to say here. Um, now, let me go on to Bima's uh, reply to this. So, opo sababe ngatasi kui dadi dewo, ising nyambi dadi buto. So, uh, what I've highlighted here are the low forms. So, these are explicitly ngoko forms, uh, and this marks Bima's speech as being ngoko. Okay. And then he sort of asks here, why did you become gods when you're just relieved from moonlighting as demons? So we have opo, what in moko, and then kui, thus, uh, also moko, and then dadi, also moko. So yes, this is explicitly moko uh, speech style. So low. So it's, it's particularly low. And I, I don't know whether this is because, uh, well, Bhima's talking to a couple of gods. So you would think, oh, uh, yeah, he, would, he should be speaking a bit more refined, but he doesn't. Uh, and also, Bayu happens to be Bhima's real father. So maybe that throws everything, uh, you know, for a loop. Uh, but then again, he does also speak low to Indra, who is not really related to him. Sort of interesting. Yes, so uh, uh, Bhima speaks entirely in Ngoko, so low speech level Javanese here. Now, uh, let me talk about uh, what does this have to do with manga and uh, anime here? So in Japan, uh, this hero archetype is um, primarily informed by narratives of Minamoto no Yoshitsune, so military commander of the Minamoto clan. And he helped his half-brother Yoritomo to consolidate power. And then afterwards, Yori, Yoritomo uh, does the, um, you know, because he's only a half brother and he's a rival, so he kicks him out. He 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 exiles him. Okay, and uh, if he were to be caught, then uh, he would be killed uh, right there. So his character, so uh, Yoshitsune's character, is seen as uh, passionate yet uh, and angry yet docile. Okay. Willful yet weak. So this is from Merrill, 2014. And if any of you who are manga or anime enthusiasts sort of recognize what this archetype is, well, yes. The modern interpretation of this is that, yeah, this is a main shonen uh, protagonist. So uh, young young man has these qualities. So being very passionate or angry yet docile at the same time, very meek. Uh, which is sort of interesting. Uh, and then what I would really want to draw your attention to is sort of like the secondary, the, the secondary or ancillary hero. Uh, in the Japanese context, it seems to me that there are lots of figures that are almost considered anti-heroes rather than a complementary hero archetype, which I would say Bima is in the Javanese tradition. So what is he? He's a strong man, he's hot-blooded, he has a hot-blooded personality, and he's easily angered. And he typically speaks with no kego. So this is sort of like, it sort of sounds like Bima. So keigo is respectful language. There are three types. Uh, there's song keigo, which is uh, respect indexing or the honorific language. Okay, this is what you say to uh, honor anyone in your presence or you're referring to. 
So sonkeigo kenjogo. So this is humiliative language. This is what you use to humble yourself. And then peinego. So this is just polite language. Okay. So we have these three dimensions at play for keigo in Japanese. Uh, but these secondary heroes speak with almost no keigo at all. Uh, but I want you to also notice something else when you do hear them speak. Okay. So we have one of these uh, Japanese secondary hero figures uh, with his parents in this scene. So this is from an anime, uh, My Hero Academia, if any of you have heard of that. Yes, it's very popular. It's been popular for the past couple of years. And yeah, I'm going to show uh, this clip to you and uh, talk uh, about what its linguistic forms can tell us. Okay, so here we go. ぞ。はい、よろしくお願いします。頑張れ。叩くんじゃねえ、ぶっ飛ばすぞ。はい。もう止まっとけば、あんたが弱っちいから。とっ捕まって来ねえの。かけたんでしょ。二人とも、やめ
it should result in something uh, interesting. So I'm going to stop the discussion right there and uh, have some time for questions. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ed. Let's, um, if anybody has any questions, let's uh, maybe pop into the chat box, your name, and we'll call on you. Lisa, did you want to jump in with your, your comment there? I don't have a question yet. Thank you, Ed. That was so amazing. It was just incredible. I had a hard time understanding a lot of the stuff in the beginning, but um, it's a lot to learn in there. Thank you. I'll, I'll think about it if I have a question. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, because it's, it's, it's not that easy to try to convey like uh, linguistically. And uh, I mean, we have all thought about language, uh, but at the same time, um, like how do we sort of uh, describe these things to a general audience? So I, I was struggling for a little bit and, and you know, I could get a lot more technical, of course, uh, but uh, I just decided to be nice to everyone here and try not to get too technical, but I had to get technical to some degree. I, I have a, a questions at uh, well more of uh, Pak Sumarsam. Yes, uh, it's more of clarification than a questions. Uh, okay. Uh, how do you define uh, all Javanese? I think that's a bit of uh, uh, unclear to me whether all Javanese actually is a Kavi Sanskrit based. Or all Japanese is uh, more of the Tengan or middle or modern. Because your example of Kukusing to Pogumelon, to me, that's uh, very much of uh, middle modern Japanese with a sprinkle of uh, uh, Kawi words. Uh, so that, that's my understanding. Of, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out that aspect of it. Uh, the second, uh, Clarification I would like you to speak more is about that uh, Balinese example of Mabasan, uh, which is maybe in there. So, because when I, you talk about uh, the absence of direct, uh, well, the indirect and direct case marking articles, I still don't understand okay. what that uh, refers to. But considering that is a Mabasan, is uh, in a way, Balinese is more of uh, Balinese Kakawin is more of uh, of Kawi old Japanese language. Uh, uh, that's my it's whether that class. has something to do with that indirect direct uh, case marking article or not. But in any event, it seemed to me uh, because the Austronesian language that you mentioned is being Indianized in such a way that maybe that's kind of explains uh, things, uh, but at least uh, to me now, uh, because Mabasan itself, it's color of respect, that may be um, the, uh, uh, equal to Harikata tradition in, in India, for example. So just, just the first one is the old Japanese and Kawi, that's uh, first and then second, and uh, you have uh, more to say about that, Mapasan. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Pa. Uh, yes, uh, so what do I define as old Javanese? Um, so it's, and I do, that, that's why I qualified like looking at uh, those texts like Kinanti, that's why I said like a uh, um, Tembang era. Uh, Javanese. So I qualified by using that, but um, I mean, yes, uh, that is a good point because uh, 
old Javanese, if I were to take a look at old Javanese, much of those texts are like Bourbon, they are strongly verb initial. So if I were to take a look at a text and if I noticed that a lot of the verbs were coming in the front, then that would seem to me, and if you didn't uh, tell me like from what era uh, those texts came from, then I would believe that uh, those texts uh, were, let's say, old, old Javanese. And then like Tembang era Javanese, you said, oh uh, yeah, it's more like early or contemporary uh, or like middle uh, Javanese with bits and pieces of uh, Kawi, uh, you know, stuck in there. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you can't completely ignore like, oh, well, you have like these two systems sort of interplaying with each other. Uh, and and uh, yes, um, and that might be a little more uh, interesting, uh, you know, to talk about more in detail. Uh, so I haven't thought about this in quite a while, and I'm not really an expert in uh, old Javanese. So I, I looked up a, a Van der Molen's uh, like textbook to get some of my examples there. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I am uh, rather interested in it. Uh, and then talking about uh, the relation of Kakawin Balinese uh, to, let's say, India. Yes, uh, of course, India does have a, a lot of influence. Uh, but uh, let's say syntactically, syntactically, uh, you can also trace uh, these uh, features that I talked about to other um, other mainland Southeast Asia uh, Southeast Asian languages, so like uh, like Mon Khmer, uh, uh, let's see, Thai Kadai, so and a lot of those are also in Indic um, influence. And I don't know whether David Gill himself has said anything about possible Indic influence, but he does say, yeah, take a look at uh, a lot of these features uh, from languages from uh, the Mekong River Valley all the way down to the Mambaramo. And you'll see a lot of patterns there that you don't see like outside of that area. So uh, that's as much evidence as we really have. Okay. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, uh, I think it's a, uh, uh, it's really a very distinct, uh, 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 synthetically or language, linguistically in terms of Kavi and middle or contemporary Japanese language. Uh, I think the Kukuseng Dupok Mulun probably is, uh, came out from the uh, Tembang Kidung 18th, 19th century. That, uh, but before that, of course, you have a whole vocabulary of li uh, literary works uh, from Negara Kertagama, uh, Arsa Wijaya, Arjuna Vivaha, all is very closely uh, old Japanese Sanskrit based language. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jody, would you like to jump in on your question? Yeah, hi, Ed, that was really, really great. Um, I was wondering if when you're looking for evidence of changes or language families, if there's a difference in um, the data that you would get from written language or from spoken language. This whether is a good the, point. The sound, whether the sound of spoken language, especially maybe being related to music, has um, takes on different patterns than what you'd see in the written manifestations of that language. Yes, uh, this is a very good point. And um, like basically for uh, let's say old Javanese, old Balinese, that's all we have left. Uh, all we have left are certain inscriptions and uh, these uh, sort of manuscripts. Uh, so, 
So you, you can't really track how the sound has changed, only how the representation in writing has changed? To a certain degree, to a certain degree. Um, so I could even uh, sort of uh, trace this to now, uh, like with uh, Balinese, how, uh, so in, in Balinese, uh, in contemporary Balinese, most varieties of Balinese uh, have this uh, sort of schwaing. So uh, word final A uh, becoming sort of like a, a more of a schwa sound. Yeah, right. so I noticed like, your, your uh, Balinese accent's very nice. I noticed that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so most, uh, so you have a lot of Balinese who are now writing that with a final E. Oh. Um, yeah. So maybe, you know, in a, a few decades, uh, I would say, um, maybe you'll see like a, a change in the writing system. So the uh, writing is changing to reflect the sound of the to language. reflect the sound yeah mm -hmm. uh, uh so i have i mean i have uh, some personal misgivings about that but that's just because uh i sort of know that uh in aksara bali so like the um with the original script you would never capture it that way uh, because there is a certain way to mark uh what's called a puppet or the schwa and uh, in those cases, with the word final A, you never mark it as such. Um, so I, when I write out Balinese in Roman script, uh, I, I still will use uh, word final A, uh, just because it is per, uh, personal preference. But, um, but that same A is marked in Javanese? That same A is... I, you mean, I mean the, final, the final A is marked in Javanese, but not in Balinese even? Uh, well, um, so this is uh, where Javanese takes on uh, sort of like a distinctive character. So uh, rather than schwa, uh, you have a, uh, so like an open O, and many Javanese write that with uh, O just because there's nothing that's like closer. Uh, and then, so you have that, you have like the Swedish style A with the circle over it. That's another way, uh, even though that's a lot more difficult to type uh, for most people. Uh, and um, that can also be explained by, uh, let's say a metrical sound change. So, uh, but uh, I, I would say in a few decades, uh, you know, it, when, if this sort of thing uh, persists, then you could get uh, some orthography uh, changes. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from Elizabeth's husband, David. Take it away, David. Uh, so two small questions about Palawan. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. okay. Hi. Hello. Hi. Awesome. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, um, thank you for a, a, a great talk. I my my background is not in um, Indonesian music, but is in fact in linguistics and um, classics. And I was really interested in your discussion of Palawakia. And I had um, uh, two questions. One is that, uh, is the language uh, of the paraphrase always the uh, local vernacular of the place where it's being performed or does it actually have its own specialized register as distinct from Kawi? And um, the, the second question is, do we know how closely the history of the performance mode of Palawakia aligns with the development of the language, that is, uh, can you trace the emergence of Palawakia as a performance mode to um, the uh, sort of creation of Kawi as a distinct poetic register and or 
the development of the vernacular away from mutual intelligibility? Hmm. Yes, so uh, that's interesting. Uh, so let me uh, address the first question first. So about the first question, uh, from what I know, um, it's basically refined Balinese. Uh, and so it's, it really isn't its own uh, sort of register. As, as far as I understand, I have to take a look at a lot more recordings to see, are there any things that might uh, specify this, uh, you know, these paraphrases as its own register? I'm not exactly confident about that because there are certain things like this ri, uh, although uh, that's also indicative of a lot of, uh, let's say, refined Balinese uh, speech levels, uh, speech styles. And then uh, uh, about your second point, um, yeah, I am not, I'm not so sure about um, the development of Kakawin because I, I do know that um, Kakawin is one such uh, sort of literary genre sort of written in this uh, sort of specialized uh, register, this Kawi register. And uh, at what point can we sort of hook up like uh, Basa Kawi along with uh, sort of spoken Balinese? And uh, in the absence of, uh, let's say, recordings, because we simply don't have them, uh, it, I think all the answers that could come out of that line of inquiry is all going to be speculation, uh, unless we have uh, some other clearer uh, sources that we can uh, definitely trace back to. Okay. Interesting, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, uh, Utu has a uh, question. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Hey. hey, Ed. Good seeing you. Well, hey, Puto. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, my questions to your to your last point in your recent interest in anime and manga and these archetypal heroes. And I was wondering if any of the linguistic changes that you sort of described, if you see that associating or pertaining to any archetypal or character changes in heroes as not only as expressive Indonesian arts change, um, but also potential real life social relationships of those archetypes in Balinese or Javanese social life. Ah, yeah, uh, that's really interesting. So I, I wanted to, you know, uh, provide a Balinese example, but the problem there is that, um, Bima, along with all the other characters, all the other main characters, speak in Basakawi. So it's really quite difficult to sort of uh, sort of link up, like, uh, what is his, like, heroic archetype, uh, besides, like, his sort of, like, um, you know, his strength and the way that he sort of uh, gruffly voices uh, things. Uh, and how does that relate to uh, like possibly changing uh, perceptions of uh, heroic archetypes? Um, yeah, that's a good question, uh, especially since, uh, you know, uh, we have more and more uh, being informed by, let's say, Western cultures and uh, like outside cultures we have like this uh, sort of cultural uh, infiltration uh, these days. Uh, so that will be something to see uh, in the next few decades. If, uh, you know, if I could start on this project now and then maybe uh, do a reprise of it like 20 or 30 years down the line or even 10 years down the line, I don't know. Um, and see uh, how perceptions of these heroes, ha have they changed? Uh, and do people still like 
um, highly regard like these uh, hero figures uh, like they did in the past. So yeah, uh, that would be something really interesting to uh, sort of keep up with. Right on, thank you. Thank you. Can I just chime in a little bit here? When yes. you, when you uh, 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 talked about Bima speaking Kavi, mm -hmm. that's a Balinese, right? That's Balinese, yes. Okay, all right, thanks. Yes. Cool. Uh, anybody else have any more questions or comments they'd like to jump in with? Just jump in the chat box and we can get to you. My question was actually the same as Jody's. Oh, Pamade uh, Lasmawan has a question. Okay. Om Swastiastu. Om Swastiastu. Um, just a uh, comment, yeah. Uh, number one is uh, on the text of the Palawakia. When you write yeah. ton, yeah, I think that's going to be katon, not N-T-O-N. -N. I think it's K-A-T-O-N. OK. Uh, you, uh, you can check that uh, in the Kawi here. Yeah. OK. And, and number two, uh, connect to uh, what is Pak Sumarsam uh, uh, mentioned, probably good idea to explain what is a uh, Bobaosan mean because uh, you know after that connect to the direct and indirect you know between uh, Juru Tanak and Juru Arti. So mm. if you can start and explain the Bobaosan what is in terms of the linguistic what is the Bobaosan mean because can be Baos or can be bas Basan between Baos and Basan. So you can explain ah, that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for that clarification for the Kawi, just because I've been looking it up on uh, other sources and uh, those other sources have written like uh, N-T-O-N, uh, but now that I hear from you that it can also be rendered as Katon, which would, very, you know, it would really change like the perception of that particular line because Katon would be like a, sort of like a, a quote unquote passive form of Ton. So that's really interesting. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to talk about in terms of direct versus indirect uh, was its relation to, and, and sort of like the loss of that distinction in uh, both uh, Balinese and Javanese. So Balinese and Javanese no longer has like this distinction of, uh, of uh, between direct and indirect uh, argument marking. Uh, but you can see this in, uh, you know, lots of Philippine uh, type languages. They, it's still very productive. And uh, it's the uh, primary way that they uh, mark voice, grammatical voice. So I just wanted to sort of make that distinction and sort of allude to, uh, you know, where does this um, definite article, ang, come from? So yeah, this ang really suspiciously looks like, oh, well, yeah, it's like ang from, let's say, Tagalog. Uh, and it's, it's, pro it's possibly, it, it's probably been uh, transmitted uh, down that way, although the functions have indeed changed. Uh, actually, uh, when uh, people first learn Tagalog, uh, so they'll use this particular article, ang, which is the direct argument marker, uh, but they will first learn it because we're all, let's say, English speakers, they'll first learn it as the, so the definite article. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is more of an anecdote than anything, uh, but it, it's just one of the uh, few ways that you can sort of, uh, uh, sort of see that trace uh, between uh, what is it now or what is it like in uh, these texts and where could it possibly have come from? So I just wanted to raise that possibility. Is this, uh, what is this connection between direct and direct on the Palawakia between Juru Tanak and... 
Oh, and, uh, so like the uh, the paraphrasing, uh, the paraphrasing, and uh, like so uh, in that way. Um, I would say that the uh, Juru Tanda, of course, recites uh, the Kawi line, and then uh, the Juru Arti. Uh, so he has that material, that Kawi material to work with. Uh, but it's really up to him, like how he wants to embellish it. So uh, in terms, and um, I have to look more into this, like what sorts of embellishments are possible? Uh, so we, we have several examples of uh, the, especially in the PKB uh, clip, so the uh, Juru Arti appealing to the audience, like, uh, I'll do this as clearly as, uh, and as, as eloquently as I can uh, for your benefit. Uh, and um, and uh, the other thing, too, is that uh, the paraphraser, the Juru Arti, does not have to be, it seems to me, does not have to be restrained by what is given there in the, um, uh, in the Kawi line, in the Kakawi line, uh, but can stretch or shrink that content to whatever uh, he or she feels is necessary. Uh, as to what are the constraints on that, I have to take a closer look and um, have to see like what uh, other options are available or what uh, what sort of strategies are available to stretch or shrink uh, the paraphrasing so that it comes within a uh, succinct amount of time. And then if you need more, then you can go into, you know, you can paraphrase later on into the next paraphrasing event. But uh, I think the one main thing is that the whole verse, so the whole paraphrase has to be encompassed by an entire verse. That much I am pretty sure of. But the internal structure, it's, it's really up to the Juru Arti and possibly in coordination with the Juru Tanda. So I hope that answers your question or cl clears things uh, somewhat. And the last one is about uh, Baosan between, you know, uh, if you look at from the uh, semantic language uh, between Basan and Baos. You know. Ah, so like uh, Baos uh, meaning uh, read and then Basan uh, also mean uh, something uh, like a, a reading of some sort as I uh, sort of understand it. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say this, uh, would be better up to like, um, Balinese speakers who have like a, a side on the issue or ha who have, um, and I haven't done so. so I mean, I, I haven't sort of like interviewed, uh, various speakers and see, and, and, you know, gotten their views on uh, what would be uh, like an accepted uh, meaning or interpretation of this particular concept. Um, so that would be something that, you know, I'll, I'll just have to do uh, in order to supplement this. I haven't done so yet, but uh, thank you uh, for the idea. So Lisa wants to jump in with um, a little bit of extra information on this. Well, it's not more information, though. This is so interesting. I, I, this is probably stating the obvious, but um, I'm wondering if you've looked at lots of different situations in Balinese paraphrasing, because it's the way theater is always presented uh, through the, this mediation. And I've always loved that concept. And um, in Mary Zerbuchen's dissertation, she talks about uh, creative copying of the lontar. So because the lontar the relationship between the written and the, the oral um, word, and because the lontar would uh, disintegrate after a couple of generations, they would have right. scribes copying them, and those copyists would be creatively copying, that they would be paraphrasing and updating, and so when we look at old manuscripts, we don't really know how much is, 
you know, the modernization at the time, or, I mean, that's, that's really interesting, but that the whole concept of paraphrasing is so important in Wyong, obviously. And so the comic servants do that too. And I don't, I mean, it's really different from Balawakia where you have the verse, you have the you know, gamelan playing, you have a more kind of constrained time period. Um, right. But um, just to compare the different ways that that's done is, just wonder if you looked at that. Yeah, and I would say uh, during Wayang, so Wayang and Topeng, uh, so you have the comic servants who are pretty much at free reign to uh, do whatever they can to uh, fully serve uh, the audience and to fully serve like uh, paraphrasing uh, like their, their masters, their, their, uh, their superiors. Uh, so I think they have like the freest reign uh, of uh, language use there. Uh, and it would be interesting to sort of look at uh, both Palawakia, like more on the constrained end, and then uh, looking at uh, just how elaborate can this paraphrase go. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know whether that would be like an, another... Um, books worth of information. <laughs> it was really interesting if you think about Topeng, the paraphrasers are paraphrasing the silent full mask. Full, but, uh, yes. So that's, that's, there's not even a, an original language, although there's probably the lontars in their heads. But <laughs> right. Now, is it true that, um, like if you ask Dalangs, uh, even uh, Dalangs nowadays in Bali, can they make a some sort of interaction using Kawi? This is what I've read often. Well, they're called Kawi Dalang. And oh, okay. Dalang who, they should be. I mean, they should be able to be fluent enough in Kawi that they can compose their own sentences. But a lot of times, I think the more time passes, people are memorizing fragments rather than able I to do see. that. The older generation, it was really expected, I think. But I, I, I can't really answer that any f more fully than that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, uh, just, uh, just one more thing. Um, keep it in mind, you know, um, because you research about the linguistic language, you know, think about Bo Baosan and Bo Basan, Baso and Baos, because uh, I get that uh, the two different uh, explanations with uh, late Pa Gadimani, you know, when, when we're talking about Palawakia. So, oh. nice job. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Pa. Okay. Um, Pitsy has a uh, comment she'd like to jump in with. Um, hi, Ed. Hi, really, in really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I have my uh, video off because I have a terrible internet connection here in Jakarta. Um, oh. so I, yeah, I hope my speech doesn't break up. Um, thank, but thank you. A lot of things to think about. And uh, I just had a comment. It wasn't about linguistics or about uh, <clears throat> excuse me, or about Balinese um, arts, as I know little about either one. It was more about uh, the characterizations I was interested that you were talking about uh, with between uh, Bima's character, etc. And I, I always like to just remember that all of these details about why Batoro Bayu and Batoro Indro transform into demons or why uh, uh, Arjuno ends up with so many wives or any of these questions, they're really sangit, right? They're up to the interpretation of the Dalang. And so, mm. so um, I, just, I just think that's important to remember because I have seen Dalang uh, for whom Arjuno is very much chasing the women rather than the women chasing him. Um, or or uh, Batoro Bayu and Batoro Indra are, are transforming uh, to test Pimo rather than because they they've been uh, punished or anything. Um, or where Bimo's less or more aggressive or et cetera, right? So I know I know you know this, but just sort of a just sort of a 
a reminder to all of us, I think, that any time uh, we see in one version that this is why this happened, or this is why Arjuna did this, this is why the gods transformed, um, that now, at least in, in modern Java, at least, I don't know anything about Bali, but in modern Java, those are all points of Sangeet. Every Dalang would be different, or many Dalang would be different. And uh, just, a, just a point about um, low Javanese that I, I always found interesting. Two other characters that only speak low Javanese are Antaseno and Sambodro, at least in most Dalang's interpretations. Oh, Sambodro. So, um, so Arjuna's wife, right? Right. At least now, um, I don't know. Marsa might have some other experience with this, with uh, other performances in other eras, other texts, other sources. But in Java, uh, the 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 modern treatment, anyway, of of Sambodro for most Dalang, is that she does not speak. Uh, any high Javanese and Bolotewo and Kresno, her brothers are always apologizing for her. Um, oh, interesting. She's, she's speaking in, in such a, in her, in her case, it's not rough, but it sounds very um, humble and kind of uh, country girlish, even though she's from a, even though she's from a kingdom, uh, she doesn't speak the high Javanese. And then Anto Seno, so of course, similar to Bimo, he's Bimo's son, and a similar case with Bimo. Um, and the, the only other comment I had was about your uh, second secondary heroic figure. A lot of what you were talking about with the aggression reminded me a little of Bola Dewa. And I was thinking- Yes, like, yes. Yeah, that might be another, a little bit more like your uh, Japanese comic examples. Right. That's so I- weirdness. yeah. Okay, so thank you, Kitsi. Yes, I was, for Katsuki Bakugo, uh, I mean, so he's one that has come about recently, and another character that's come about recently is um, uh, Inosuke uh, from uh, Demon Slayer. So he's another sort of figure who fits mm -hmm. in this, like, uh, al uh, alternate hero uh, uh, archetype. Uh, so, so, yeah, I was really thinking about Bolo Dewa uh, and just like how angry like he is uh, in most of his interactions. And uh, uh, Bakugo is also quite angry. So he's either brooding or he just screams at everyone. Uh, yeah. And, and um, yeah, I, I mean, the, th the thing with Bolo Dewa is that even though he has uh, a lot of heroic qualities, ultimately he ends up uh, being an antagonist uh, on the antagonistic side. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, I'm just sort of wondering whether uh, that's sort of like, okay, well, he's sort of antagonistic like in personality, so it's all right for him to be placed on this side. Whereas uh, in the, Japanese anime uh, example. So Katsuki Bakugo, he, he's just like grown up with the superpower and uh, it's made him uh, very conceited uh, and very uh, sort of shallow. Uh, and uh, so mm -hmm. uh, when his parents talk, like his, his mom is also hot headed uh, but she still knows when to use, let's say, Kegel, you know, especially when talking with teachers and uh, strangers and uh, things like that. So she she's still aware, uh, but it's it's Katsuki who's gone out of control uh, with the speech and behavior uh, for most of the time. Well, and uh, I think one of the reasons Bola Dewa ends up on the Karoa side is only because his wife and Doyodono's wife are sisters. So that's sort of like a, an in-law um, loyalty. But um, there are other reasons too. Anyway, I, I thought he might be an interesting one to look at. But thanks. Thanks so much for your talk. It was very interesting. Thank you very much, Bakitsi. Yeah, so Zama. Hey Ed, I have a question uh, to bring it, uh, well, to keep it sort of in this realm. I'm wondering about the manga stuff a little bit. So, yeah. I'm, 
Do you pay attention to Javanese manga? Because I, I know at least when I was living in Indonesia, it was very popular to draw manga style characters. And if you do, um, are there any popular ones that you would recommend people check out? And then the question relating to the archetypes is, um, do you notice if, if you do pay attention to this stuff, um, are the Javanese manga writers interested in sort of emulating the Japanese uh, archetypes a little bit more than the Javanese archetypes? Or are they uh, maybe putting um, different traits onto Javanese characters than are otherwise present? Oh, that's a good question. So I'm not too aware of Javanese language manga. Now I'm sort of interested in uh, checking those out. If you have any recommendations, uh, please send them on uh, to me. Um, and uh, like, I haven't really seen them. So I, I'd, I'd have to take a closer look and see, uh, are they taking after, uh, let's say the, um, Japanese models, or are they taking more after the uh, Javanese models, or are they taking like a hybrid of the two? Quite possibly. Uh, so uh, yeah, that would be like a further uh, line of inquiry. Thanks, Ed. I will. Uh, I will try to look it up a little bit more, and I'll send okay. out. Okay. Thank you. Are there any more uh, questions? Any last minute comments, questions? Do you want to jump in? All right. All right, Ed, I don't see any, any other questions coming in. So um, unless you want to make a closing statement, um, I'll just say thank you. Uh, yeah, so let me just close uh, by saying thank you all so much uh, for attending. This has been a, a very sort of nice uh, intellectual exercise. And uh, I hope to see you all here in the coming weeks. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt, for hosting this. No problem, Ed. Uh, I'd like to make... Uh, an two more short, quick announcements before we go, something I forgot to mention earlier. Um, Gamelan Sekarjaya is starting their own lecture series uh, this Wednesday. Um, so if you're interested in more talks about Balinese Gamelan music and, and Balinese Gamelan musicians, I think you can register on the Sekarjaya website. Um, and also, I mentioned earlier that our fundraising was in phase two. It's actually in phase three, because I didn't even announce phase two, um, which is the Balinese funds that we have raised, which are going to be distributed from, uh, for us through In-Situ Records and a unique project we are working on with them. So there's going to be some more information about that um, coming up shortly. Uh, thank you, everybody for attending, and we'll see you next Sunday for Patsumar Sum's lecture on learning to play Gender. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Matt. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Pa. Santi.